Uh, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Scaltetti, and I am the director of the Declaration of Independence Center for the Study of American Freedom. Uh, the mission of this center is to ensure that University of Mississippi students and faculty have an opportunity to explore the nature of freedom in America, as well as the sorts of constitutions, laws, policies, and norms that support or hinder freedom. I hope you'll take some time to visit the center's webpage, and please don't hesitate to reach out to the center at our email address, freedom at olmiss.edu. Sir Roger Scruton, who passed away in January of 2020, was widely viewed as one of the leading thinkers of the late 20th century conservative intellectual movement. As a political philosopher, Scruton wrote many influential books exploring first principles of political theory, and he thought deeply about the philosophical meaning of freedom and how freedom, properly understood and appreciated, related to our other important social values. But we should also note that Scruton didn't just write about philosophy. He tried to live a life that embodied his beliefs and he worked to establish underground academic networks in communist-controlled Eastern Europe before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Independence from a repressive ideology is not something that happens magically or by nature. It requires action. And that too is why I think it's important to reflect on the legacy of Scruton. Not only was he a deep thinker, but his life gives us an opportunity to think about what it takes to engage thoughtfully, but tangibly in a struggle for independence. To help us appreciate the legacy of Roger Scruton, I've invited Dr. Daniel Cullen to speak to us today. Cullen is a professor of philosophy and political theory at Rhodes College, where in addition to being an award-winning teacher, he also directs the Project for the Study of Liberal Democracy. Professor Cullen also does important work for a number of nationally recognized academic organizations. He is on the Academic Council of the Jack Miller Center for Teaching America's Constitutional Principles in History. He serves on the board of the Association for Core Texts, Studies, and Courses, and he is a member of the recently formed Academic Freedom Alliance. Having published various essays and books on Rousseau, Montaigne, democratic theory, and liberal education, Cullen has recently turned his scholarly attention to the political philosophy of Roger Scruton. Not only, however, is he now writing a book on Scruton, but he personally knew Scruton and interacted with him on a regular basis. And so I can't think of anyone better suited to reflect on the significance and legacy of this important thinker. So Dan, uh, thanks so much for being here today. And with that, I'm going to turn uh, things over to you and put you in the spotlight. Well, thanks very much, uh, Stephen. It's, it's an honor to, to be here and I'll do my best to uh, put Roger Scruton in the, in the spotlight. It's uh, hard to believe uh, for me that we're coming up on the second uh, anniversary of his untimely death. Uh, the world of philosophy um, suffered a, a tremendous, tremendous loss. I want to uh, notice that point one in the mission statement of, of your center, as you acknowledged, is dedication to an open-minded exploration of the principles of American freedom. And you're certainly practicing what you preach this afternoon. Uh, Roger Scruton was, was a British philosopher, very much so. Uh, a friend of, of America, uh, also a, a, a gentle uh, critic of America. And yet, as a conservative philosopher, definitely a critic of the Enlightenment principles, especially the notion of individual rights and social contract, 
that operate in the in the background or between the lines, as it were, of the Declaration of, of Independence. But maybe the, the challenge Scruton poses isn't so direct, since your center has, I, I think one can say, a small c conservative purpose, conserving the principles of American freedom by studying them and acknowledging, as, as you do, that uh, the country has other worthwhile values and, and goals that stand in, in relation to, to freedom and, and vice versa. So I think one could say that the task of an American conservative is to conserve the principles of liberty. But the meaning of conservatism simply, or what I sometimes call mere conservatism, like the meaning of, of liberalism, is very much in, in dispute and up for redefinition. And that's going on as, as we speak in, in the United States. So it's worthwhile, I think, for uh, Americans to pay some attention to the writer and the philosopher whom uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, declared our greatest conservative thinker. And if there's a theme or a central proposition in what I'll say this afternoon, it's, it's this, that the, the preservation of a freedom cherishing or liberal political order depends, this was uh, Scr Scruton's view, on certain conservative philosophical insights or propositions. Liberalism historically was a philosophy of limited government. The purpose of government was to guarantee the rights and freedoms of individuals who are imagined to be originally outside or prior to and therefore independent of any political order. And so it follows that authority is justified only insofar as liberty requires it. Conservative philosophy can be said to originate in skepticism about that picture of individuality or selfhood. Or to put it more positively, the conservative views the human person as essentially relational rather than independent. In that perspective, individual freedom is not regarded as a premise, but as an achievement, as it were. And it emerges in and through a social process in which we discover what we value and build attachments to those things that we value along the way. Uh, here's one way Scruton puts it, quoting, the process whereby human beings acquire their freedom also builds their attachments and the institutions of law, education, and politics are part of this, not things that we freely choose from a position of detachment. So why does this metaphysical issue of the nature of the self matter? Because when individual rights are the exclusive source of social and political legitimacy, the trajectory of social life is a progressive emancipation, as we would say, or liberation from the framework uh, of customs and institutions that give concrete expression to freedom in the first place. To put it simply, the unchecked tendency of liberalism is towards its own dissolution. In the conservative view, the liberal political order that limits government, separates public and private spheres, recognizes the equal moral and political standing of individuals, establishes authority on secular grounds, provides for popular participation in its deliberative procedures. All of that has been headed for a crisis insofar as it has always rested on certain foundations that abstract liberal principles erode. Another British uh, political theorist, Margaret Canavan, put it this way, modern liberal democratic ideals depend for their plausibility on the collective power generated by national loyalties that are inconsistent with the ideals themselves. If this proposition is true, then conserving liberalism 
depends, uh, one might say, on understanding liberalism rightly. If liberalism is to endure in this view, it must adopt conservative means to liberal ends. But what are those means? Patriotism or those resources, the nation state, religiosity, a common culture. Those are the things that Scruton wrote about. In other words, for uh, liberalism to in endure, one could say it must become a conservative liberalism. Or perhaps the better term would be a liberal conservatism, which I think Scruton would have preferred. But what is the right understanding of conservatism then? And this brings us back to Scruton's own philosophy, which you know, he articulated across 50 books ranging back and forth uh, among music, architecture, art, neuroscience, religion, the history of philosophy, politics, the environment, and uh, not least in, in his view, wine drinking. He also, he also wrote operas and novels of which he was justifiably proud. He, he once told me uh, very offhandedly, uh, we weren't in any deep uh, conversation at, at the time, we were waiting for a taxi in a hotel lobby in Dallas. Uh, he said, you know, I didn't set out to become a spokesman for conservatism, quote unquote. He said he had always been more interested in aesthetics and cultural matters generally, and he was really anxious to get, to get back to that. Uh, to that stuff. And in fact, he did. But later, uh, that remark put me in mind of a famous self-description uh, by Montaigne, uh, who called himself an unpremeditated or accidental philosopher. And what he meant was someone who begins not in, you know, theory-induced abstractions, but in pre-theoretical opinions and customs of everyday life and who, who seeks and who always intends after taking whatever intellectual odyssey uh, he takes to return to that place. Scruton liked to describe uh, his orientation as a thinker in similar terms, bringing philosophy to the task of exploring and explaining what he called the, the life world. He always used the German Lebenswelt the life world in which human beings find meaning. So what I'll try to do is, is touch uh, as briefly as I can on, on the following themes. One, this uh, unpremeditated character of Scruton's conservatism, as it appears to me, which, which respects the way things are, the way we find human beings always already attached to shaped by, immersed in a customary life, and which refuses to take its bearings from a hypothetical state of nature in which human beings appear to have no proper nature, but instead only an abstract quality, as if the human being were reducible to freedom, and freedom was a, a matter of mere independence of others. Then, uh, secondly, I'll try to connect how uh, Scruton uh, uh, draws out of this a defense of the nation state and a conception of citizenship, which interestingly forswears conscripting religion to the task of forging what he called a first person plural identity. He argued that um, while religion is uh, the paradigmatic example of the, of the social bond, it cannot be the primary loyalty in a society of strangers. And the, the challenge then is to think of how one can have a community of, of strangers living under the secular rule of law and holding together as a substantial community. And my third and, and uh, final point has to do with the particular uh, challenge that uh, conservative ideas pose in a predominantly liberal culture. 
or maybe the, the challenge for uh, conservative ideas in a predominantly liberal culture. Scruton himself put it this way, how can conservatism be an item of contemporary belief, conviction, and how in particular can it uh, recommend itself, sell itself, if you like, to a self-consciously modern person who by definition isn't strongly motivated by national identity, religious belief, traditional cultural attachment. That problem is exacerbated by a central paradox of conservatism itself that Scruton never shied away from, and, and this is how he, he phrased it. The fact that our most necessary beliefs may be both unjustified and unjustifiable from our own perspective, and that the attempt to justify them will merely lead to their loss. Our most necessary beliefs may be both unjustified and unjustifiable from our own perspective, and the attempt to justify them will merely lead to their loss. This is, I think, connected to uh, a longstanding uh, view of conservatism that it's more of, a, of an attitude than a, than a system of thought, and it's always challenged to give itself a kind of rational articulation. I'll zero in on just one aspect of Scruton's effort to you know, escape this conundrum, and that is his conviction, I'm quoting now, that it is the task of art to supply what religion can no longer offer us, namely the experience of sacred things. I think it's striking that virtually everything uh, Scruton has to say about politics as a way of belonging is already intimated in his writings on aesthetics and architecture. And uh, what I'll try to do briefly uh, later is to show how his political understanding seems to originate in, or at least aligns with his understanding of, of culture. That's one thing I'm, I'm still trying to grapple with in the, in the book I'm writing. So point one, Scruton's conception of personhood as relational. He says, we become self-conscious and free agents in the process of addressing one another across the whole repertoire of emotional and moral responses. We look into the other in search of what he, he describes as the real but hidden self from which that other person addresses us in a reciprocal I to you encounter. All that is important in human life arises out of this relationality, responsibility, morality, law, love, religion, and not least art. It's through seeing the world and each other in this way, Scruton writes, that we develop as self-conscious beings. And as we develop ourselves, we also develop around us the external forms of our inner freedom, the external forms or manifestations of our inner freedom. The liberal respects human agency, obviously, but in Scruton's view, crucially misunderstands its foundations by subscribing to what he dubbed the born free fallacy, according to which our obligations are created entirely by our choice. He says, in all its variants, at every level, liberalism embodies the question, why should I do that? And to the extent that no answer is forthcoming, which proves satisfactory to the first person perspective, to that extent, we are licensed to initiate change. The liberal perspective then, Scruton thinks, cannot really account for the value of freedom in the first place. He says, people are born into a web of attachments. They're nurtured, protected by forces, the operation of which they could neither consent to nor intend. 
So their very existence is burdened with a debt of love and gratitude. And it is in responding to that burden that they recognize the power of the ought, or to put it another way, they recognize their own uh, significant moral agency. And so he says, I'm quoting again, our basic debt to the world is not one of justice, but of piety, a posture of, of gratitude and, and obedience. But liberalism, liberal theory, always shifts the burden of argument to the side that questions the paradigm of liberal obligation itself. As Hobbes put it, you know, in conceding no duty that does not arise from an act of one's own will. This onus shifting um, feature of liberalism amounts, Scruton says, to a renunciation of true political existence, that's his, his words, by systematically undermining the legitimacy of the actual responsibility that people feel. Social relations among self-conscious beings like we are, Scruton thinks, involve always reason giving and reason taking. The individual regards herself as a person so that others so regard her in their dealings with her. Persons, he says, may be persuaded, educated, and criticized, and each possesses a sphere of responsibility within which he or she is answerable for what occurs. And, and so, whatever real meaning freedom has, he says, derives from this fact of responsibility. You can't get away from it. He, he describes freedom um, as akin to a metaphysical halo that we attribute to the responsible self who manages to rise above you know, mere nature and, and the rest of nature and is something more than a creature of, of desire. The person, in his sense, appears in the world, this is his phrase, as the target of interpersonal responses like resentment, admiration, anger, esteem. And for Scruton then, here's the big conclusion, it follows that the social tie itself, properly understood, is an individualizing bond, one that unites one person to another in a relation of responsibility. You don't get the individualization without the social bond. That would be another way to, to put it. Now, those metaphysical arguments are, are challenging and, and complex, and uh, I'm not sure I have a handle on them, but I hope it's, it's a little clearer now why Scruton insists, to go back to an early point, that the appeal to a pre-social state of nature in which conventions are, are sloughed off so as to recover, you know, even uh, at the conceptual level, a purportedly more authentic, original individuality, why that, uh, that way of thinking is a fallacy and uh, ultimately a destructive one, because he writes very uh, uh, ominously, outside society, there is nothing distinctively human. And outside of society, all values are annulled. That's what the abstract state of nature uh, bequeaths to us. So the, the, the point is, Individual freedom is indeed a significant human good, but the liberal conception of individuality that undergirds it fails to acknowledge the very conditions that nurture it in Scruton's view. Okay, how do we get from these metaphysical heights to, to politics? Conservatism, Scruton said, was born in response to the predicament of the modern individual severed from history, from custom, from religious usage, and at the same time burdened with a conscious yearning for those things. So liberal theory described 
uh, what is sometimes called an atomistic individual, but that didn't erase the actual facts of, of human life uh, in, in, by that portrait. The modern moral order emphasizes now the mutual rights of, of individuals conceived in that kind of abstraction from the loyalties of, of country and, and creed. And this conception, he thinks, has become so dominant, so successful, that indeed we take it to be self-evident and we adjust ourselves to the marginalization of older views of society that depended on a more providential or revelational account of human meaning. Conservatism, he says, then has, uh, has been challenged to try and find, refine perhaps the grounds of political existence concretely in a world that he says is increasingly swept bare by the abstractions of liberal theorizing. What's, what's his uh, underlying sense? I think it could be put this way, that no political order can achieve stability if it can't call upon a shared loyalty, which he uh, refers to as a first person plural identity, one that distinguishes those who share the benefits and burdens of citizenships, citizenship from those who are outside the community. The defect of liberal citizenship, he thinks, is that it seeks to do no more than to guarantee the social contractors their natural rights by converting them into civil rights and leaving each person, as Rousseau famously put it, as free as he was before. Scruton's objection is no genuine we can arise on such an understanding. And time and again, across those 50 books, he points out the way an unreflective piety that is not uh, connected specifically to any doctrine or, or dogma, but is a, a feature of the life world, as it were, how an unreflective piety hallows social relations, this is his phrase, and underwrites obligations without appealing to ideas of contract. He says, no ordinary commerce between people can achieve this social effect because ordinary commerce depends on negotiation, consent, respect for the rights and, and duties of others, and therefore assumes the subject to be, um, or posits the subject to be alone and inviolable within a kind of sovereign sphere, shut up in a, in a fortress uh, all by oneself. He says, the first person plural that one finds in the religious right, for example, R-I-T-E, the religious right overcomes that kind of isolation. And uh, this is his phrase, displaces considerations of justice without quite repudiating them. It's a very subtle point. In religious uh, rites and ceremonies, he says, the solitary self is raised up to a new and transcendental perspective, sharing the subjective viewpoint, which otherwise we know only as mine. In other words, achieving a first person plural perspective. So what I've just described would lead you to expect that like Edmund Burke, like Joseph de Mest, like Hegel, Scruton would define the conservative task, the political task as restoring the centrality of religious identity in political life. And I once argued that uh, to him and he insisted that uh, I had I had thoroughly misunderstood him. I think he was right. Instead, he proposes a national loyalty, a first person plural that involves, but also marginalizes, does not make primary loyalties of family, tribe, and especially faith. 
The first person plural, he says, is the sine qua non of a stable democratic order, and the price of losing it is ultimate social uh, unraveling. But the nation must forswear the religious loyalty that is the very paradigm of membership because a creedal community is incompatible with the rule of secular law. And so Scruton's way out of this conundrum, trying to get that thick kind of membership that we find, again, paradigmatically in uh, societies held together by common religious faith, in a society of strangers, his, his term, who are going to live under secular law, the way out of that conundrum, get the religious uh, dividend, to put it uh, functionally, without um, reliance on religion itself, leads him to an argument that there's a kind of cultural unity on which politics can, uh, can draw. And it can be won through a political nationality, a version of citizenship in which rights are respected, public duties are minimized, religion is privatized, and you can see how this vision now seems to come back uh, uh, quite closely toward the, the stance of liberalism itself. Here's the, the way I, I interpret what he's getting at. Modern individualism uh, may be the warp of social life, but the weft remains the connectedness that stems from a shared experience of the place to which we belong and to which our ancestors belong and we imagine our descendants might belong, people who are unknown to us, but never the, nevertheless united to us, right? In a shared uh, membership, a shared belonging. That's Burke's famous point about the kind of social contract, the kind of, of partnership he endorsed. Nations for Scruton are properly defined then not by ethnicity, by kinship or religion, but by a homeland, a territory. And when he looks back at the arc of Western political development, he sees it as a movement of detachment from the primary loyal loyalties like religion and a reattachment to land, territory, and that kind of historical shared belonging. So his conception of the nation state is, is very carefully calibrated, emphasizing now this and now that element of the, of the compound. He takes pains to emphasize that it's the country and not the group and not the tribe that's the locus of identity. And it's not the territory alone, but the history, culture, and law that we share that makes a territory ours. So the relevant we, that first person uh, plural, is not an ethnos, but the people who have coexisted, endured in a partnership that stretches uh, beyond the present in, in both directions toward past and future. Ultimately, he writes, um, I'm quoting, nationality is composed of land together with the narrative of its possession. So I think it should go without saying that uh, Scruton doesn't call for the suppression or the exclusion of religious belief in a society that is going to um, be run under secular law. Um, his point is that religion, uh, however, cannot function as the primary focus of loyalty in the modern world. That's just a fact. I'll quote again, people who see all law, all social identity, all loyalty as issuing from a religious source 
cannot really form part of this political culture and will not recognize the obligation to the state or the love of country on which it is founded. Those are really sweeping claims. I'm, I'm not sure that religious convictions generally must be total in the way uh, presumed here, but that's something that Scruton specifically writes out of his vision of the um, political community. However that may be, it remains our fate, the modern fate, is to live in an increasingly desacralized world without a break on the instrumental attitude that treats human beings as means rather than ends. That's another quote from Scruton. The world of obligations, he says, has been steadily remade as a world of contracts by successive waves of secularization in the modern period. And in this situation then, the restoration of the sacred may be a political hope, but he says, he insists, it cannot be a political task for making it so would risk the collapse of liberal political institutions. And here may be a, a warning for um, a new genre of, of American conservative, so-called uh, national conservatives um, who are, who are uh, having some influence in the moment. Modern peoples, Scruton says, have learned to tolerate each other's differences, associate rapidly, move freely in and out of relationships, partnerships, uh, ways of life. We've struck a bargain to live on peaceful terms without the intimacy of traditional creedal or tribal ties. And in a, a very poignant passage, Scruton writes, I don't say that this is a good thing, but it's the way things are and the inevitable byproduct of citizenship as I have described it. A society of strangers whose relations will not be face to face, so to speak, but merely side to side in the manner of neighbors. And in that perspective then, the patriot is a citizen whose respect is for the laws and procedures that define his rights and freedoms, and who therefore consents to relate to his fellow countrymen as citizen to citizen, rather than as members of the same ethnic or religious community. But crucially, the we at the center of this political nationality is understood to arise not from a hypothetical agreement of abstract individuals, but out of the attachment of a concrete people to a place and a settled way of life they recognize as their own. It's a consensual we, but it's one that comes into being by compromise and sacrifice and involves cooperation and competition. Well, those emphases on place, settlement, law, negotiation, sacrifice bring me to my last point, which has to do with the salience of Scruton's first and last love aesthetics. And I'll just offer you some bullet points, which you're not going to object to uh, at this point since I've gone on too long. Originally, he says, building was connected with settlement and settlement was connected with consecration. Sacred architecture is the paradigm of all building, he says. The temple that allows the gods to dwell among us also facilitates our coming together as a congregation where citizenship is on display. Settling means abiding. And Scruton says, we abide in the land only if we also abide by law. And again, the classical architectural templates affirm, he says, what's sempiternal in the midst of change, telling us that we belong where we are and that we belong together as a community. So a city 
becomes a settlement when it is treated not as a means but as an end in itself. And the sign of this is the attempt by its residents to beautify it, to beautify it, which he describes as uh, essentially fitting things together as you fit things together in your own home when you decorate it. There's another conservative thinker, Michael Oakeshott, described it. Politics is the activity of attending to the general arrangements of a collection of people who, in respect of their common recognition of a manner of attending to its arrangements, its law abidingness, in other words, compose a single community. Scruton's reverence for the common law, about which he, he um, spoke again and again, stems from the fact that the amendment of human relations, that's a really resonant phrase, is not a matter of making them conform ever more closely to some ideological pattern, but to quote Oakeshott again, by exploring and pursuing what is intimated in them, reading something out of them, as it were. This search for what's fitting is the very heart of the aesthetic experience, and Scruton makes provocative claims for it. For the aesthetic self is also relational, and the search for the fitting or the appropriate expresses, he says, a bid for social membership. What he means, I think, is that the aesthetics of everyday life is other directed through our aesthetic choices. We're making ourselves present to the eyes of others. Another evocative phrase of his is, we are suitors for agreement. Or to put it uh, another way, he does, we are suitors for acceptance, ready to make the small sacrifices and adjustments that are required by social harmony willing to negotiate, accommodate, compromise. It's often said that our politics has descended into uh, a culture war and some regard that as epiphenomenal, a distraction from more important economic things. Scruton thought that culture matters to politics for these reasons I've tried to, to sketch. Culture counts as an essential source of moral and emotional knowledge about what to do and what to feel. And his appeal for cultural renewal didn't stem from, I think, an impulse to, um, so to speak, aestheticize the, the real world, but from this desire to make sense of it as it really is and to restore a conception of human association that he thought was commensurate with the actual sources of human value. The task of conservatism in a world impoverished by what Scruton, Scruton called the culture of repudiation was to consider how that human world might be imbued again with a meaning that could enable us to come home to ourselves and restore our relations as persons. So to, to sum up, the conservative proposition is that society is antecedent to the individuals that compose it and that a pre-political we is the precondition of liberal individualism. This view is, is compatible with the classic liberal proposition that preserving individual freedom is the primary aim of government, since rightly understood, human beings owe their individuality to the social conditions in which they're brought up. Rather than being born free, we become or are made free through our social membership. And for that reason, though, the libertarian heirs in desiring to liberate individuals from the sources of moral authority that keep people attached to a form of social life, as George Will recently put it in his um, magnum opus, The Conservative Sen Sensibility, the truth is that libertarians or liberals need conservatives because the latter are concerned with preserving the moral ecology requisite to liberty being put to worthy uses. A free society is more than a collection of people released from moral constraints because without the latter, social cooperation isn't possible. In short, 
There can be no democracy without a demos, a we united in a way that neither extinguishes alternative or competing loyalties, nor eliminates the differences that endure among people who remain sovereign over their individual lives. And who we are, Scruton thinks, is unknowable apart from where we are, which leads back to this idea of attachment to place and to the conjuries of feelings and relationships that make a country a home to be loved and, and not least uh, to sacrifice for. Thanks. Well, thank you uh, so much for that, uh, uh, Dan. There are so many interesting and rich, <laughs> uh, rich things uh, in that talk. I, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, at the bottom of your screen, uh, you should see a little reactions button, and one of the buttons under there is called raise hand. <laughs> so if you do have a question, uh, go ahead and hit the raise hand, um, and then I'll, I'll call on people um, as you uh, pop up here on the, on the screen. Um, to give you time to think of a question, I'll go ahead and start with uh, one, if, if I can. Um, Daniel, I'm, I'm curious about whether Scruton believed um, if, if there were, let's see, how should I put it, if he ranked different countries based on uh, how well they were doing <laughs> in terms of uh, facilitating and then expressing this first, uh, first person plural uh, we. Um, were there some countries out there that he thought were doing a better job at producing a settlement uh, and a, 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 an architectural aesthetic space that made people feel that they were uh, in a community? Or was his opinion that, look, in modernity, every nation state is just kind of this blizzard. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and um, there's really no way for any country to do better uh, than any other. Um, but we can still talk about this ideal. Um, it's just the differences between countries are negligible. Yeah, closer to the closer to the second view. Um, but I here, here's one thing he, he emphasized in, in one, of those, one of those 50 books, you know, I think six of which maybe were devoted to the idea of conservatism it, itself. In, in one of them, he said, look, there, um, there are two kinds of conservatism or, or two, two modes of conservatism. One is an empirical conservatism and the other is a metaphysical conservatism. And uh, empirical conservatism is obviously relative to place. So each nation is going to have its, its own traditions that shape it and, and give it its uh, a particular identity. Each uh, nation is, is going to have customs that it wants to preserve. And, you know, I, I should say in, in passing that Scruton didn't believe that customs should somehow be fixed and, and frozen. Uh, a point he argued again and again is that uh, tradition can only be preserved by, by innovating. But empirical conservatism is, is obviously going to be uh, a different thing in a, in a different place. And so uh, it's, it's clear that for Americans, uh, to conserve the American inheritance involves conserving liberty. That may not be true in, a, in another country. But I think he, he thought that there was um, a generic, so to speak, um, conservatism that is expressed in, in this um, metaphysical understanding of, of conservatism that is summed up in, in his idea of the, of the sacred um, and in this attitude of, of piety, which I think could be maybe explained uh, succinctly this way, that uh, a, a sense that we are 
that we owe a debt of gratitude for the givenness of things and we are not uh, simply makers of our of ourselves and of our of our world as i described in in the talk itself and everywhere i think but especially in the um the liberal orders of of the of the west north america europe one, one sees the resources of the, of the sacred, if I can put it that way, under pressure. And, and one's, so I think rather than rank countries in terms of success, he might perhaps just point to uh, differential rates of erosion. So another way maybe of, of putting the, the, same, the same point. And I'll, I'll add one other thing. So this, this raises the question of, uh, is, is the conservative stuck with the fact that, as Irving Kristol once, once put it, you know, societies depend on a certain uh, fund of moral capital and social capital, but uh, it's steadily depleted and their own principles uh, make it uh, difficult or impossible for them to restore it. You know, uh, only withdrawals can be made from 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 that bank account, so to speak. I think Scruton thought to a, to a certain extent that's that's true, but largely because liberal concepts uh, of of contract or the liberal mode of viewing all human relationships in terms of the contractual paradigm had that corrosive effect. He, he writes quite um, uh, revealingly, I think, about, uh, about marriage um, understood in terms of a contractual relationship versus in terms of a vow. So there's, there's a, a root pessimism that the trend of, of the modern world uh, everywhere is toward the erosion of the foundations of that uh, first person plural. On the other hand, I think he believed that people genuinely did care about these kinds of attachments and people experienced um, a, a, a certain painful alienation in their, in their lives under modern conditions. Um, obviously not true of everybody, right? But I think uh, Scruton would say most people think of themselves as somewheres, and it tends to be the elites who think of themselves as anywheres, right? The cosmopolitans who are uh, as happy to live in Paris as they are in, in London or, or Brussels. Um, and to the extent that, cons um, that people really do have this, uh, so to speak, transcendental experience of sacred things, of seeing themselves not um, uh, not merely as as the art architects of their of their own world, there's there's something there to try and restore or preserve, but one can't do it without calling attention to the corrosive effects of a certain understanding of liberal individualism. All right, great, thank you. Um, let's see, on my cue, I first have a, a Jackson, Jackson Dellinger. All right, uh, first I just wanna say thank you to uh, Professor Cullen, absolutely, and to uh, Sir Roger Scruton for uh, putting out such a beautiful and uh, well thought out understanding of conservatism and especially its relationship to the sacred and the aesthetic through art. Um, I think this is a, a beautiful way to understand traditional conservatism. But I did have uh, some issues 
And my issue here with Scruton is, I think I may be the first person to say this, but I don't think he goes far enough. <laughs> I think he stays a little bit you too much. You may be the first person to make that particular accusation because he was considered a, a radical. Right. <laughs> I think um, I'm just questioning why, if to me, the sacred is the foundation of the political community in this seemingly like what liturgical act of in which there's like a we that is described when a person takes place in a religious right, why I shouldn't go forward and say, uh, rather than just a mere hope, the sacred should be the task, and why I should be particularly concerned with the erosion of liberal institutions and secular law, if that's the very foundation of political community. Because even though I think Scruton describes himself as being in Burke's camp against metaphysical abstractions and the like, mostly, it seemed to me that the description you just gave of his philosophy was deeply engaged in uh, a metaphysical view of what people are like generally as human beings, so. Right, yeah, and I, I think, so your question is if, if religion is the the ultimate way of, uh, or the most powerful way of underwriting that experience, um, why shy away from it? And I think, uh, as, as I said, I, I originally thought that Scruton's political um, philosophy was, was thoroughly, so to speak, uh, parasitic on, on a religious understanding that he he didn't want to um, make make uh, or, or give prominence to in the way that I thought he he should I think his his argument is that it's it's just an, an impossibility to um, go back to a, a form of society that is that is going to be centered on on religion as societies had been in the past. It's, it's simply the, the modern fate. Uh, one, could, one could call it a, a concession to pluralism. I mean, he, he thinks that, again, the religion is the paradigm of membership, and he draws attention to the etymology of the, of the word, you know, uh, religio, it's, it's the same root as um, our word for for ligament to uh, to tie together religion ties us us together, but his uh, so his his gamble uh, perhaps one could one could say is that while religion is the paradigm of of membership and shows how uh, a first person plural identity is involves this openness to um, the experience of the of the sacred. Scruton understands the sacred in, in a pretty capacious sense. He he once said to me, uh, said to a small group of us, you know, my my uh, religious ideas are a little bit pagan, and I thought, yeah, a, a little bit pagan is sort of like being a little bit pregnant, <laughs> you know. Um, but that's where the, the move to culture comes in. And he, he puts um, all his chips, I, I think, on that notion that we can have another path towards that first person uh, plural identity that is, that is nourished by something more than the kind of individualism and the limited individualism that uh, liberal theory offers give give people the uh, the sense that uh, allows them to um, see themselves as as part of something that makes the sacrifices that social life inevitably requires possible. That that can be that can be achieved by secular means so to speak. He doesn't, he doesn't, as I said, he doesn't want to um, secularize society a la France. And uh, he would say um, societies that, that have religious traditions 
um, ought to keep them ought to keep them vital. But this is one place where I think he would probably depart from um, American uh, national conservatives, so-called, about whom I know only only a little, who who do I think make that argument that obviously we need the resource of religion to hold society together. Let's not let's not pretend otherwise and let's let's just live up to that. Um, he wouldn't he wouldn't go there. Right. Great. Thank you Thank so you. much. <laughs> Thank you, Jackson. Uh, next up I've got uh, Christian Seller. Um, hello, Dr. Cullen. I'm Christian Seller. I teach in public policy and I and I am a geographer by training. So I was surprised, I was pleased to see that he scrutum roots his uh, metaphysical we in a very particular sp spatial scale, which is the scale of the, uh, of the nation state. Does he write anywhere about the possibilities of alliances? In particular, how do nationally rooted communities contend with uh, a left that starts as uh, uh, as international that starts as the conserv as a with the communist internationalist so left starts cosmopolitan while on the other side we have community metaphysical community rooted in the nation state do we have a possibilities of alliance or not in his view Hmm. Um, that's a that's a very complicated uh, question. The he's certainly a fierce critic of what we would we would call now globalism, and he was certainly a, a critic of the European Union. He was a leading proponent of of Brexit, and you know the. So uh, suspicious of supranational identities because I think he thought um, that first person plural is, is difficult enough to establish. The idea of a, of a universal identity was, was simply not credible to him. And I think he associated it with you, with dangerous utopian um, illusions, Marxism um, being being one. However, nations can have uh, friendly re relations. Nations can cooperate in uh, in solving uh, problems. But I think Scruton would insist. We had this discussion yesterday. Um, with, a, with a class focusing on his environmental thought. I think his, his view is it has to be a product of negotiation. And uh, to stay with the example of, of uh, mitigating environmental pollution, one, one has to ask ultimately, what is the motive for a society to fulfill international agreements that are going to require it to sacrifice, right? Uh, there's no real enforcement mechanism available to, to do that, so it has to be consensual. But people are not going to sacrifice in the way that Americans are, uh, among others, are going to have to sacrifice in, in the future because they are committed to um, an, an abstract internationalism they will, they will make the sacrifices necessary to preserve their environment because it's the place that they are attached to and they, and they love. The, the motive, uh, he, he, wasn't, um, he wasn't embarrassed to, to say this, that the, the motive of human sacrifice in politics is not going to be reliably uh, rational self-interest. It's, it's going to take love. But uh, how can countries cooperate? You know, they'll they'll cooperate in the way that that neighbors do. They will negotiate their differences. They will stand on their rights to be to be sure, but they'll also uh, negotiate their their differences, compete and and cooperate. 
and and seek seek uh, mutual advantage where it's it's available. Nothing nothing pre prevents that. Uh, but what what bothered Scruton was the so to speak the ideology of the European Union, which uh, clearly aimed at transcending nations and national identities. And I think he would say, you know, look, that's turned out to be uh, a pipe dream. But meanwhile, the, uh, the overriding of national sovereignty by uh, EU rules was, was something that he thought um, people began to rebel against. And the notion of the free movement of, of peoples sort of, um, I, I think he said uh, or thought under just undermined the the basic idea that people could legitimately feel an attachment to place and not want to make it hostage to um, the the continual um, disruption and upheaval of of market principles. So. Um, Nations had to had to have more control over their sovereignty if uh, if they were going to be able to create this kind of of communal membership that is going to give meaning to political identity. I, I know I haven't uh, answered your your question, but that's that's what comes to my mind. Thank you. Right, thank you, Christian. Um, all right, we'll have the final two questions here. Uh, first, uh, go ahead, uh, Judah. So, uh, Sir Scruton thinks that um, it's really important to have a very strong attachment to, to home. Uh, what would he think of, say, moving from one state to another state because you don't like living in the state you're in, or, say, moving from one nation to another nation because say another nation, it's, you have more opportunities in that nation. Um, what, what, what do you think of, of that doing that? Yeah. Um, certainly that's, that's what- Dan, you should point out that you're a Canadian who immigrated to America now. This is before. <laughs> that's right. Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, I, have a, I have a complex, uh, background, um, grew up in the second largest uh, French speaking city in the world, Montreal, uh, as a minority within a minority, and uh, then moved to the um, United States. And, and I am a citizen now, I, uh, I have all my, my papers. Um, uh, one of the reasons I'm interested in, in Scruton, I think, is because I've, I've had such a deracinated life and never really felt like I was part of a, of a shared culture that was, that was difficult for me. Look, Scruton himself was, was a world traveler, and he was at, as at home in, in Paris um, and, in, and in Prague as he was in, in London. And... Uh, he loved he loved Washington, um, New York maybe not uh, not so much, but I so I, I I think he you know he wouldn't want to um, certainly prohibit that would be that would be out, outrageous that that sort of thing if if someone wants that kind of experience then indeed it's, it's freely available and our life is organized to facilitate just that. So you're not in any danger of, of losing cosmopolitan um, options in, in the modern world. What, what Scruton uh, worried about was those who perhaps wanted to uh, try and preserve that kind of attachment to, to place. And one of the things that really bothered him was the American highway system, you know, our pride and glory, right? But as he saw it, just uh, cut through cities and destroyed urban, urban centers for the sake of moving people through 
the place where uh, everybody lived. I, I once uh, suffered a, a harangue, uh, more than once a, a harangue from from him about uh, an overpass that we were we were going through in um, in New Orleans, and I, I had to say, you know, I I, I didn't do it, uh, and I'm originally from from Canada. The uh, he was part of a of a movement called uh, New Urbanism that was trying to restore the livability of, of cities. And one of the things that he, uh, he emphasized was human beings really want streets, you know? Yeah, it's true. We, we like super highways and uh, six lane highways and eight lane highways, but where we live, we want streets. And we want uh, buildings that aren't ugly. And there are some simple things that we might do to improve the quality of life, such as, you know, uh, put the parking lots in the back of buildings instead of in the front of buildings where uh, they, they just ruin the, the streetscape. You know, every concession we make is to uh, mobility, to the, to the automobile and not to the, the habitat that people in fact want. And, um, you know, I think he thought European cities remained superior places to live than American cities, uh, managed to retain their character, whereas American cities all seem to be um, variations on the, on, the same, on the same theme. So, Sure, uh, those who want to take advantage of the cosmopolitan opportunities of, of the world um, have, have a, a great ability to, to do that. But what needed defense was, the, you know, the alternative um, ways of living that are increasingly under siege and from not least market, market forces. So that's, that's one way in which he breaks ranks with some American conservatives who are more market friendly than, than Scruton. All right, and the last question will go to Thomas Kemmler. Tom? I, um, yes, so given, uh, as Judah said, um, that Professor Scruton really, you know, emphasized the importance of, of land, um, you know, as, uh, for culture, for starting culture. I wonder what his views are uh, on like um, preferring a smaller group, a uh, smaller piece of land, a smaller country uh, to a much larger country um, because of the different geography that that will, that will you know, be in, the, in that big country. The first example that comes to mind is like, uh, United States and how like you know during the Civil War there was a big kind of gap and between the north you know being a more manufacturing uh, centered and the south being more agricultural and just how that difference in geography played you know such a big role and really um, had completely very different economies in the north and south and um, so I just wondered if, if uh, Sir Scruton had any thoughts on, on that and if, it, on if he thinks or, or thought that, you know, smaller geography areas are better uh, for countries. So issues like that would be less likely to arise. Yeah, I can, I can see the, um, the logic of, of that. You know, England... Um, England's a small country. Britain is a is a small country by American standards. I was always uh, astonished by uh, how you could get from one side to the other there in uh, in what seemed to me no no time at all. I don't know that the the size of the of the country per se matters as much as the the political understanding that 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 governs it, and um, again, I, I think of the the criticism he had of the of the European Union or the the ideal of of Europe, 
which was a problem, um, as, a, as I said, because he thought it, it strove to transcend the very kinds of things that make life um, meaningful for most ordinary people. To, uh, to give them an, an identity that was um, beyond a national territorial identity. I think that's something that, that isn't necessarily an effect of, of size, although you might think the larger the country, the more pluralistic it would, it would be. I mean, he, um, I think he did have a serious argument with Scottish nationalists and um, and maybe Irish nationalists who were nominally remain part of the uh, you know so-called United Kingdom, but in but in his view, really want to have the benefits of of common membership without the costs. Um, and he, he complained more than, more than once about England being the, the loser in this, in this deal. So I, I can see a sense in which um, the, the scale of a, of a country could become a, a significant thing because one might think under, again, under modern conditions, the larger uh, a territory you have, the more you're likely to, to need some kind of federal arrangement as Canada has, as the United States has, as, as Britain formally does not, but increasingly in fact perhaps has, especially in the, in the case of, of Scotland, given, giving Scotland more prerogatives in order to keep it in the, in the union. But I don't think, I don't think size per se was the the crucial thing in in his view. It was more about the the kind of uh, whether whether it was going to be a cosmopolitan culture or a, or a more national culture governing the the ideal world. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. And I, why don't uh, how about everyone? Let's give a Professor Colin a, a round of <laughs> a round of applause, if I can make the <laughs> a round of emojis. A round of emojis. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Um, that was incredibly enlightening and lot, so many interesting points. Um, and I'm already looking forward to continuing our discussion tomorrow. Um, and I'll see you then. Thank you again, and thank you everyone who attended. Bye-bye.